Three D audio is gonna Sony be the world the world of generation. I'm pretty sure Tech Mobile has a speed run. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this week's Most Elite Podcast. This episode is just a quick. It'll probably be less than ten minute episode. Uh, yeah, I came across an article yesterday on GameIndustry.biz where Stephane Diastos, at least I hope that's how you pronounce your last name, gave an interview on Idiosis Montreal and Square Enix failures on Deus Ex, Thief, and Marvel's Avengers. And the reason I'm doing this podcast is because if you may remember, I did a podcast where I was like, oh, Square Enix is selling all of its Western studios and all those IPs that they possess, which are numerous... Sorry about that. It's a quick pause. You didn't notice. But anyway, uh, this there they sold all their Western studios to the Embracer Group. And uh, they sold it for about $300 million. And I know that price tag seems small for a company that has Tomb Raider and Deus Ex. I, you know, I feel the same. So recently, Square Enix has... Uh, had a bit of a... a an explanation for that they had an official statement where they said at the time of the deal would let them focus on investments in blockchain AI in the cloud they published some financial results and they, they explained further the reasoning behind their, them selling the companies they said that it will it would allow them to achieve sustained growth through selection and concentration of company resources better aligning overseas publishing operations with its Tokyo HQ and focusing on new businesses such as blockchain, AI, and the cloud. They said that they intended it to reshape its digital entertainment portfolio partly through creating new IPs, speeding up decision making through an integrated group management, and by boosting game development capabilities by establishing new studios, etc. Now, if that all sounds like TED Talk speak. It's because it is. Uh, honestly, I think the breakdown, and we'll get into it further with the interview from Stephane, but I think the breakdown was just a whole bunch of like frustration with, as they said in this report, they want to better align overseas publishing operations. I feel like there's a whole bunch of frustration from their, their Tokyo site their Japan side teams and their Western side teams. And I think they just felt like, you know, fuck it. Well, you know, we're, we're tired of it, but we're going to sell it. And that's that. I do think that's what happened. I mean, honestly, J- Japanese studios, they sort of kerfuddle me. And I talk about this with my friends all the time. I feel like they don't care about money and that's so weird to say considering every single company to ever exist only cares about money no matter what they taught you in company school no matter what your boss told you on that weekend retreat that he took you on that time that felt inappropriate and then he put your his hand on your shoulder and you were like is this going where i think it's going yeah no matter what he said that night when you gazed into each other's eyes or she or they no matter what they said to you that day They only care about money. So I it's so weird for me that I truly believe that Japanese companies don't care about money. Now, it's really weird. And I should rephrase it. They don't care about money as much as their image or as much as their pride. And I think that's where they differ from American or hell European companies. I think the American and European companies care much, much more about their bottom line than the Japanese do. And you can see it with, like, game publishers. Like, you know, the screening situation. You can see it with game publishers like Capcom. You know, after KG Inafune left and everything, they never touched Mega Man again. Mega Man is a beloved character. F- f- generational. Like, generationally beloved. You know, your your parents played Mega Man. Then you played Mega Man. And maybe your kids play Mega Man. They don't care about Mega Man. He is not pushed. He is not produced. There are no Mega Man games that are, you know, they're not, he's nowhere near as big as he was. Look at Konami. Uh, 
Silent Hill. That's it's set dormant. It's been dormant since what 2008. They don't. They there's nothing there. Hell, back to Capcom. Where the fuck is Dino Crisis? Right? Like where is anything? Capcom owns so many IPs. Where are they? Where's Power Stone? Right? Like. And you would think in this super money hungry climate that the, that game developers and us the consumers have created, because we are just as guilty of creating this money first climate by capitulating to these devs when they release these games or these publishers even when they release these games when it's clearly designed to take our fucking money, we are just as guilty. Our hands are just as as bloody or dirty. Uh, in this situation, it's really surprising that like the Japanese studios just don't give a single fuck. Dude, Dragon's Dogma came out. What year? Fans have been begging for it. I feel like ten plus, ten plus years. They just announced it too. And I can't. There, there is no, no, no sort of narrative I create in my head fits outside of they simply don't care. They can't care. They can't. Money is sitting. There is money waiting for them. Hell, even if they just all made a mobile game, there's so much money waiting, and they haven't done it. So there is nothing that I can. There is no plausible explanation to them not doing it. Then they just don't care. So we keep. What does that all mean in regards to the topic of today's podcast? It means that Square Enix, you know, the Japanese side at least, didn't care about the IPs of these studios. They just want it to be fucking done with it because they've lost so much money. Uh, they lost so much. They lost so much money. Uh, they released a statement alongside Embracer's statement. They said that going forward, the company's development function will comprise its studios in Japan, Square Enix external studios and Square Enix Collective. It added. Companies overseas studios will continue to publish franchises such as Just Cause, Outriders, and Life is Strange. Those three franchises are pretty much dead. Just Cause, what, it just released four, right? It has its audience, but would you call Just Cause a AAA massive success? I wouldn't. And I like Just Cause. I think it's running around in wanton destruction is always fun. But would you call Just Cause, like, game of the year? Would you call Outriders game of anything? That shit ain't even game of the week, let alone game of the year. As far as Life is Strange, it, it has done very well and it has tons of sequels and lots of stories worth telling in it. But again, would you call those games the best of Square Enix? Like When you think of Square Enix, do you think of Outriders, Just Cause, and Life is Strange? I don't think you do. So like those those two statements there, to me sound like yeah we're gonna we're gonna do the development back here in japan and you you screw this collective guys you know we'll, we'll publish some franchises for you people but as far as making games i think we're gonna do that and the president of square said uh that the company's japanese studios should not try to make games aimed at western players in an interview with Yahoo Japan, Yosuke Matsuda explains that while it's vital that Square Enix sells games on a global scale, it would be a mistake if its developers tried to imitate Western styles of games. All of that says to me, they felt like the Western studios failed them. They felt like they failed themselves by trying to pretend to be the Western studios to get the money. See, th this is how you know they want the money, but they don't. They're not sure how to get to that money, but they want that money because the way he's talking and the, the way it sounds, it's, well, you know, we, we made some mistakes. And all throughout the Avengers lifespan, dude, every interview when people ask him, so what about the Avengers? It was always like, well, you know, maybe it was the, they, at one point they set up, they gave it to the wrong team. They was like, we think it could have been a success. We think that model works, that FOMO, I mean, look at Destiny 2. It, it does work, but. You know they 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 don't know how to make it work. You know Bungie's Bungie's got away with it. Mobile games get away with it. They couldn't. They they weren't allowed to get away with it. And uh, it but it sounds like they believe it still can work. They just they're sick of losing money trying to find out how. Right. 
So we're going to redevelop. We're going to concise our developmental platform over here on the Japan side. And, you know, we're going to sell these studios, those IPs. Keep in mind, that's Tomb Raider. That's fucking Hitman. Right? That shit over. And that's going to be that. Going back to the interview with Stephane, uh, why he left. He says, uh, back in 2013, this development of events could have been predicted. I went because there was a lot missing in the head office. Square Enix had great developmental teams at EDOS, but they didn't have enough knowledge about how to sell their games. That was obvious. And so he says in the interview exactly what I've always been saying about Square Enix and their desire to be a part of the big boys club and make that billion dollars on the next whatever online game, Destiny clone or whatever the fuck they're going to do. They, you, they tried it with Outriders. They want to be on the train. They just don't know how to get it. They don't have to take it. They're like, they left it at home. They don't know how to get on. And, you know, the, the fame, Stephane, he, he's, he's got an industry veteran, knows what's up. And uh, he says that barring Tomb Raider in those years, it was that was a very different era. Edios's great games and the Hitman series could have been six, seven, eight million copy projects. He truly believes that. He says Deus Ex could have been one as well. Don't get me wrong, we made good numbers, but I always felt that the way EDO sold games was too traditional and conventional. There was a lack of innovation, and so the circulation of games suffered despite their quality. When Square Enix bought EDOS in 2009, I hope this would change. So, and then he moved. They move on to the failure of Thief, which was their next big project after Deus Ex: Human Revolution in 2014. He says, we did everything we could. We had to work hard. That's life in game making. Not everything takes off. But we were close. Missing a few finishing touches. The Deus Ex team was one of the strongest I've ever put together. They stood one by one on the mountain. They understood the challenges ahead. With Thief, I no longer had the luxury of having skeleton of people who had worked together before. So I hired talented people. Very talented people. But they hadn't had a chance to work together before. That's probably one of the reasons why it didn't go as smoothly as it did with Deus Ex. He, they move on to the failure of Marvel's Avengers. Uh, he says, maybe when they sign the contract, superheroes are popular. They still get a lot of attention, but they're starting to get boring. Especially in games. Few people have managed to release successful projects with superheroes. There's always Batman from the guys at Rocksteady. Then there's Spider-Man, but among all of those people who have done this sort of thing, the success rate of superhero games hasn't been very good. Maybe it was seen as an easy way out. Maybe they thought it was easier to sell a superhero game than a traditional game. Heavy words. Heavy words coming out of Stephane here on uh, Marvel's Avengers, and especially about the success of superhero games. Because let's be honest, what was the last good superhero game before Batman Arkham Asylum revitalized superhero games? Was it Spider-Man 2002? Was that the last good one? Like, single-player, open-world action-adventure superhero game. Because there's good ones. There's, you know, there's, obviously there's the uh, Diablo clone games, the Marvel ones. And those are amazing. And, you know, those are pretty good. But single-player action-adventure superhero games. When was the last good one aside from Spider-Man 2002? Right? So, crazy to, crazy to hear from him. Then they went on to talk about Square Enix's unrealistic expectations. Uh, they, he, he recalls a moment in 2012 when the financial report revealed that Eidos was projected to make $65 million in profits, but the group only made a $65 million loss. He says, we were stunned, especially because we had no releases planned for that year. Eidos began to worry about its fate. And Stephane tried to ask Square Enix man management in London what the studio should do, but they didn't say much there. He goes on to say, tensions began to build both from my subordinates to me and from me to my superiors. I think when people are in a crisis situation, you can clearly see their values and behavior. And I did not like what I saw. There was a great lack of leadership, motivation, and willingness to talk. And when you don't have those basic things, no employee can work properly especially when you lead a studio 
I, I was losing hope that Square Enix Japan could make something big out of Eidos. I was losing confidence in my head office in London. In the annual financial reports, the Japan office always added a few phrases. And this is very telling about what I was saying earlier about the Japanese market and the, the, the way Japanese companies work, sp specifically game companies in this instance. He says they always added a few phrases. We are disappointed with certain games. They did not meet our expectations. And by that, they meant only games not made in Japan. So he felt slighted. He felt slighted by the Japanese studios, the st studio side. He felt slighted by his London side. And he just he felt hopeless from from everything that was happening. And I think it's very telling. I know I did a huge podcast about the Avengers and stuff and how I wish it would have worked and how it was dead in the water from when it first came out and I wanted it to not be, but you can tell. And this is sort of the be behind the side of it and like the human side of game development. I don't know these guys are faceless and nameless to most of us, the players. We just buy the game and if the game the game's good or bad, category's done, right? There's no nuance on the internet unless you find a pedantic channel that, you know, reads articles and shit like this and explains them to you, much like this one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to hear it, to know that I'm right about them not giving a fuck and valuing their image over fucking money, you know, because they, Avengers could have been, Avengers could have been amazing if they just spent more money on it. Like if they, they showed out the cash for licensed costumes and shit like that, and it could have been a goddamn hit. Then they moved on to about Square Enix Western Studio sale. He so he has a point here. What he he says he says uh he's surprised. For example, the same studio that they sold to Embracer recently bought Gearbox. They created Borderlands, by the way. Embracer owns Gearbox now. Guess how much they bought them for? They bought them for one point three billion dollars. They basically bought Borderlands for one billion dollars because because Gearbox pretty much only has Borderlands to its its claim to fame rightfully so borderlands is fantastic so he goes on to say gearbox has about a thousand employees Edios has about a thousand employees gearbox has borderlands and other stuff but Edios has five time five times more franchises so why did they give four times less for Edios? i guess few people are interested in it unfortunately it's a sign of how sick Edios's potential is to me it was like a train wreck in slow time. You could tell the train was moving the wrong way. Maybe that's where the 300 million comes from. It isn't really much, and it doesn't make any sense. He he doesn't know how much Square Enix Japanese office is to blame for Edios's wobbly state, but claims that some of the bad decisions definitely came from London. So look, I mean that that difference is huge. I mean they they definitely bought these five studios and like m years of IPs and work for 300 million which is not a lot of money man your average bad marvel movie makes that much money right and it it's hard i mean i just wanted to go over this because i i was fully invested in the avengers when it came out and outriders if you go and listen to my outriders podcast like these are things that i cared about like just as a gamer and I wanted them to succeed. I really did. And seeing them not succeed and then like wondering, well, what the hell is going on? That these two games, which should be successful, simply aren't. And then it's easy to blame the devs. It is easy. It's super easy to say, well, the developers fucking blew it. And we got to stop ourselves sometimes when we do that. I know I'm guilty of it, too. And be like, well, who told them to do it? You know, with, with Avengers, obviously Square made a lot of the decisions on that game. Uh, EDOs just designed it, I feel like. I feel like Square let them design and develop it. But in terms of its monetization and all that, that's that's Square Enix. They wanted to, to recoup something. And then when they couldn't recoup it, they they sold. They literally sold it for nothing. No money. And then that money that they, that small bit of money that they sold it for, they're, oh, we're going to make, we're going to make new studios with it on the Japan side. Like they just, <laughs> They just said, fuck it, man. And that's cr it like, it sucks that it proves my point that they don't care. They cannot care about the money because they, they made these games for all this money, lost all this money, sold it for a little bit of money. And now it's going to use that money 
to maybe line some pockets, you know, because they all they did was say boiler speak. What are they gonna open five new studios or three hundred million dollars? It's not gonna happen. No chance. They're probably just gonna, you know, dish out a little kickback to those who they felt they they failed, you know. Like financially, not even on no like Japanese honor shit. Like financially they felt like I fucked up whoever I fucked your shit up with with releasing this game or these string of failures from our Western students. Because you know how they're going to, they're not going to take responsibility and say they did it. They're going to say the Western studios who we licensed and work with failed. So we we're in the red. That's what they're going to say. And it's, I mean, look at this shit. It's proven. They they pretty much already say that, you know, and it, it fucking sucks. And I hate it. And I, I wish game development worked how, I wish game development was as fun for the developers as it is for us when we get the finished product or as it is exciting for us when we see the new teaser trailer or we see we or a full trailer or a demo is released and like I wish it was those moments like you remember going and playing like a 64 at a fucking Kmart or whatever when you were a kid because they had the demo stations up and all the kids would surround you and you would look up at the because the screens were super high above you because you're fucking two feet tall and you would look up and everyone everyone is smiling those moments still happen now they don't happen the same but it's like getting into an early beta with your friends and you've all been working all week you know because you're older now you've all been working all week and it's the weekend's coming up and everyone's off somehow. Everybody's schedules lines up and the new goddamn duty early access drop. And you guys all love duty. And now say what you will about Call of Duty, right? Like, oh, same game, whatever. It brings joy to millions of people. And for that, it has my respect. So, like, when it's the weekend and everybody jumps in and everyone's, everyone's playing a new game and they're trying to new perks and new guns. And everyone's just fucking happy for even just five goddamn minutes of their life, right? Like, it sucks to see... That game development, like, look at every bombshell reporting from Jason Schreier, who used to work for, I don't even remember who he used to work for, he works for Bloomberg now. Damn, who did he work for? He was, Kotaku. And, like, look at all his bombshell reporting about, like, this shit that happens to these devs. Crunch and all this bullshit and the, the abuse. And then you get, you get this, you get the publishers on the other side of the world saying, yeah, y'all fucked up. Y'all ass. Right, like that, that, that can't feel good. You're a founder. You create. You're if you're Stephanie Diastus, you fucking founded Edios, and you had to, you had to run away from it. You had to abandon ship, and walk away from a thing you built, because you knew it was going nowhere. Because everybody got their hands on it and twisted it out of whatever it should have been, and it was supposed to be big, and it just never made it. And now it's sold for to Embracer Group, who are just buying everything. By the way, look them up if you guys get the chance, or maybe I'll do a podcast on them. They're buying everything, and uh, now it's sold. And all your work and years of work, fucking, that's that's that. That breaks my heart. That it's not the same for them as it is for us, the players. And I just wish there was something we could do about it. Anyway, thank you for watching this video, and uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the day or week or whatever wherever this video finds you. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. See ya.